Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar with EDF, where today's topic is how the UK grid will handle the growth of renewables and battery storage on the road to net zero. I'm Andy Colthorpe, editor at Energy Storage News. I'm really looking forward to hearing about the contribution the UK's renewable energy and battery storage industries have made towards the clean energy transition and how we can scale that contribution up towards the net zero future that has to be achieved. It's a serious challenge. While those of us with a close eye on the sector can rightly applaud its achievements, taking fossil fuels down to less than half of the generation mix, we all know that the climate crisis is urgent enough to not allow us much time to celebrate. We'll be hosting COP26 in just a few weeks, and although it will be about the commitment of governments everywhere, the eyes of the whole world will be on the UK and whether we can meaningfully say, yes, we will keep increasing the pace of decarbonisation, and by 2050, hopefully, we'll be wondering why we ever thought net zero was such a hard ask. It will just be a part of our daily lives, just as much as smartphones or the internet have become. It's also a question of creating sustainable industries with sustainable energy, and that means creating job opportunities and economic well-being to benefit the whole country and our international friends and partners. And if I may be permitted to say something on a lighter note, it's also about understanding the cool technologies and innovative business models that are finding their place in the world. And I think it's okay to get excited about that, even as we face that serious challenge. The growth of renewable energy presents that challenge for the grid as well as for the energy market. And today we'll be hearing about and discussing how we can manage as well as accommodate the rise of clean but variable power. For example, wind presents a massive opportunity to deploy renewable energy capacity, serving more than five gigawatts of average demand in the past year, and with many more gigawatts on the way, both on onshore and offshore, but it also drives volatility that needs to be taken care of. Our experts today are extremely well placed to take us through many of the relevant areas. With such a big topic, we aren't going to solve it in an hour, but we will be able to present an understanding of where the market is going and discuss how the net zero grid can become a reality in the remaining few years available. My colleagues, Dr. Finley Colville and Molly McCorkindale from Solar Media Market Research will present some analysis and findings from their industry leading market intelligence service. Finley will talk about solar and the rise of renewables, and Molly will talk about the battery storage projects in construction, development, and planning stages around the country. After that, I'll be joined for a panel discussion with EDF's Head of Energy Trading, Stuart Fenner, EDF's Head of Wholesale, Mark Cox, National Grid's Head of Strategy, Claire Dichter, and Mikey Clark, co-founder, Chief Operating Officer and Chief Technical Officer at Pivot Power, a developer and investor in battery storage. As always, the audience is the most important part of our session and we welcome your questions. Please put them in the tab on the right hand side of your screen and we will do our best to answer as many of them as we can in the audience Q&A at the end. And with that, over to our experts, Finley and Molly. Thank you, Andy. So um, I'm Molly McCorkindale. I'm a market analyst at Solar Media. I've been working on the UK and Ireland battery storage reports. So I'll be giving you an over overview of the battery storage market and then I'll pass over to Finley for solar. Um, all data taken in this presentation today is from Solar Media's in-house market research analysis. So the UK's energy storage market. This graphic shows us the built capacity by project size by year, where the total operational capacity is approaching 1.5 gigawatts. Um, real growth of installed capacity started to show from 2017 and peaked during 2018 due to successful EFR projects completing. 
So it's likely that 2021 will see the highest installed yearly capacity so far by the end of the year. Operational capacity is dominated by large project sizes. Almost 50% of operational sites are larger than 30 megawatts. And the one gigawatt landmark was reached in Q2 2020. This next graphic shows us the built cumulative capacity by co-location. So in 2019, deployment was a bit slow because the market moved towards more flexible models. In 2020, deployment was also a bit lower than expected due to construction delays. We have 22% of the total operational capacity is from co-located sites. This is likely to start increasing as most new wind and solar farm applications are now being submitted with battery storage. We have already started to see some applications for 49.9 megawatt size battery storage co-located with solar or wind. This graphic shows us the planned capacity by co-location by quarter. So you can see there has been a massive record break in 3.7 gigawatts of quarterly submitted capacity during the second quarter of 2021 this year. So this is bringing the pipeline to now 20.6 gigawatts. The successful results of the EFR auction in 2016 caused the spike in planning applications in 2017, but the recent spike in Q2 2021 was mainly driven by the successful approval of previous applications and just simply by the fact that average project size is becoming much larger. The market has been dominated by standalone projects where 79% of the planned capacity is from standalone projects. So this graphic shows us the total capacity of energy storage by build closure status. The pipeline has increased much faster than deployment so far with 20.6 gigawatts planned and 1.5 gigawatts operational. We have 1.3 gigawatts are currently approved and also have grid connections. This suggests that these projects will be completed within the next 12 to 18 months. Then we have around 8.5 gigawatts are approved in planning and these have the potential for deployment within the next few years. We have around 5 gigawatts that have submitted their applications but are awaiting approval and then just over 4 gigawatts at the pre-application stage. So that's screening and scoping requests and then finally there's just over 1 gigawatt that is not active so they have either been refused in planning or the developers aren't going ahead with construction but these sites these sites still have the potential for future deployment so now i'll hand over to finley to go through solar yeah thank you molly um so i'll go through a few slides on the uh, solar in the uk so this first slide is really showing how solar has evolved in the UK. I guess it's a classic case of an industry that was incentivized um, back from 2010. Um, so this is basically the deployment each quarter and it, the quarterly deployment is split up into the ground mount, which is the one in the dark red, which is dominant. And then we've got the two rooftop segments, um, residential and commercial. So basically the spikes that you see um, effectively, the spikes are kind of end 2010, a little bit, and then the big ones, uh, Q1, 14, 15, 16, 17, and a tiny little one in, in 2018. These are all uh, renewable obligation um, deadlines, and effectively the last major one was <coughs> Q1, 17. A lot of grace period projects then getting built out under 1.3 rocks. Um, and then when the incentives um, were finally removed, then um, basically there was there was virtually nothing happening um, 2018, even at this, you know, to 2000 and, and the first half of 2019. 
And then we started to see planning, planning and planning um, for a large scale utility. And much of that would came down to the fact that there was a bunch of reasons, but mainly the capex on the site build um, significantly different to back in 2010, 2011, when the, there were incentives in place and the pricing of components, the cost to build a solar farm is a lot higher. So what's happened since 2019 is, um, you know, there has been a flurry of um, ground mount projects built, um, much lower in numbers. But the real activity has been on the uh, project development side. There's a pipeline now which is above 20 gigawatts, 21 gigawatts as of last week of projects being planned. About half of that is um, um, screening, scoping. And then the other half is um, in planning at some stage. This is long-term plans. This is 40, 50 megawatt sites. Um, and you're know, looking three, four, five. It's a whole range of different stakeholders. Um, there's a number of players that are in on the act this time that were not there before, so large um, energy utilities in particular, um, you know, including EDF and uh, LightSource BP, um, Statcraft. And then there's a bunch of um, project developers that are kind of in it for um, you know, a fast buck, you know, develop a bit of land, sell on the, um, developed the um, approved project but the bottom line is there's a huge amount of activity and I see this as being you know over the next five to ten years there's no um, incentives incentives are, are great when it's the only thing that enables deployment to happen um, but actually when when you don't need them and the CFDs is an example where solar doesn't need CFDs it's more of a um, distraction at the moment than part of a long-term picture because the cost um, component now in solar has come down so much that you can get return investment um, standalone. So just finally, what that you know, 20 gigawatt um, pipeline looks like, what I did was I pulled out um, of that 20 gigawatts what had actually you know, gone um, um, full applications in, which is a, just a, a few, you know, three gigawatts worth. And um, it literally, you've kind of got half and half. Half of it is planned as standalone solar. The other half is really tentative adding on storage. Um, it may or may not happen. It's better to get that in at the planning stage than, than not. Um, but fundamentally, the economics has to work on the solar being, um, uh, having a return on investment for, um, you know, pension holders, um, private um, equity funds. Um, solar has to be standalone um, without subsidies. And then anything else is a bonus, a CFD or a revenue stream from storage. Um, but practically everything is, is based on, on solar being um, cost effective. So what we have with solar is a, a lot of planning going on for the, um, you know, really for deployment in the next five to 10 years. So I'll pass back to Molly just to do the conclusions. Thanks. So um, in summary, We've got operational capacity for energy storage is 1.5 gigawatts. Energy storage pipeline is at 20.6 gigawatts. Record breaking 3.7 gigawatts of quarterly submitted battery storage capacity in Q2 21. And the UK has installed over 14 gigawatts of solar PV and solar pipeline has exceeded 18 gigawatts now. Thank you for listening. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much, Molly and Finlay. Um, I think that was really, really enlightening to just see it all put in numbers, the kind of, uh, you know, the kind of activity that I guess a lot of us are sort of familiar with from our own little areas, but to see it all kind of brought together and, and yeah, it's just the sheer, sheer amount that, you know, solar's got to 14 gigawatts now, uh, ground mount solar's remains largely dominant and moving into a post subsidy phase uh is pretty exciting i guess and yeah so i'm sure there's a lot more to come on that and uh, obviously through our uk uh, solar website uh, solar power portal uh, you can of course get in touch with molly and finley uh, if you'd like to hear more 
uh, from on their work and kind of pick them up on anything. Uh, you can also get in touch with them via us at Energy Storage News. So with that, I think it's uh, appropriate to go on to our panel discussion. I'm um, just going to briefly introduce the panelists by sort of name and job title, uh, kind of in the interest of brevity, really, I guess. Uh, so with us, we have EDF's Head of Energy Trading, uh, Stuart Fenner. Uh, EDF's Head of Wholesale, Mark Cox. National Grid's Head of Strategy, Claire Dichter. And Pivot Power's co-founder, COO, CTO, Mikey Clark. Hi, everybody, and thanks very much for joining us. You may now unmute yourselves. Terrific, thanks. Okay, so we'll head straight into these questions. And of course, everyone in the audience, do feel free to keep popping your questions into tab on the right-hand side, and we'll get to those a bit later on. So number one, how should the UK balance this uh, need for greater electrification and higher electricity demand, uh, you know, coming from things like, not just from the energy sector, but obviously electric heating, electric vehicles, um, versus the retirement of thermal fossil fuel power plants. Um, yeah, who'd like to take that on, first of all? Andy, maybe I could um, jump in. Um, as you say, I, um, I work for National Grid, but my background is actually working for the electricity system operator, and I ran commercial operations um, as we went through the kind of renewable explosion, if you like, that um, Molly and Finley um, spoke about. And I thought it would just be interesting to maybe um, give an operational context to that question. So um, as Molly and Finlay um, very eloquently set out, we had a real um, uh, growth in both renewable um, deployment and also battery development over the last few years. Um, and the ba batteries in particular are playing um, a very important role on the system as we see the deployment of re renewable energy um, growing. Um, looking forward, that's only going to continue and grow. The electricity system operators committed to being able to operate a zero carbon grid by 2025. Um, but I think what's important to note in terms of the context of your question is um, whilst there will for sure be demand growth um, in terms of electrification of heat and um, transport, just as important as the megawatt growth is actually the physics of operating the system. And with a high renewable system, um, the, the, the physics challenge um, becomes greater. And that's where technologies such as batteries both help to contribute to diversity supply, which is really important for security, but actually really help with the changing nature um, of the of the operations of the system and fast acting technology that can quickly arrest um, disturbances and um, incidents on the system it is going to be even more vital um, going forwards as we go into re a greater renewable system, as well as providing kind of storage capacity to offset periods where potentially there's lower wind or lower sun, so less generation happening. Okay, okay. But I guess there's a, a kind of a challenge with the, the strategy of getting it right, you know, where and when those batteries are, are kind of put in really, I guess. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think um, the key question is, where do those assets best um, generate or gain the value for the capability that they bring, both physically, so um, where they're located, but actually the markets that they're operating in? And are, are those assets really attracting the, the value for the contribution that they make to the system? Okay, okay. Yeah, sorry, go on, Mark. Sorry, Andy, I was just wondering whether I could step in a little bit on, on some of the policy side on and build on Claire's Claire's response as well. You know, I guess mm. as 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 we as you set out, I think at the beginning, um, you know, the UK has made significant pro, pro, progress in, in decarbonizing the um, electricity sector and, and clearly more more is needed. Um, and as Claire picked up as well, you know, as as we seek to decarbonize other sectors, um, you know, I, I don't think we should underestimate the scale of, of growth needed 
in low carbon generation capacity over this coming decade. And we've already seen through um, the Prime Minister's 10 point plan and the energy white paper at the back end of last year, um, you know, some, some of those government ambitions and indeed sector ambitions as well. You know, 40 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030 is a huge, huge um, uh, step forward um, and, and scale of investment is, is very large. Um, and I, I guess as part of that, we shouldn't forget the network side of this. Um, it's all very well ha having the um, generation, but we need to be able to connect it all and, and we can talk about some of the challenges there. Um, but for me, you know, some of this is about the fossil plant coming off the system as well. And um, as you know, uh, coal, coal plants likely to be off the system in the UK over the next uh, couple of years. And then we're sort of coming up to the 30th anniversary of um, of the 90s dash for gas um, and therefore some of that plant will also be reaching end of life and I think the key for me on that is really that currently those assets provide a, a great deal of um, important flexibility to the system um, and, and indeed um, as Claire pointed out some of the system services and some of the physical uh, parameters that you need to be able to operate the system um, and I, I guess the last few weeks have shown us um, some of the challenges when, when you know, the wind isn't blowing and the importance of that. Um, and so I think the other piece really that we really need to focus on is making sure we have the right policy arrangements in place to bring forward um, some of that pipeline of, of um, flexible assets. Uh, and, and I think an important document in, in that respect is the government's uh, smart system and flexibility plan that was published earlier this year, which sets out a range of actions. So I think for me, uh, there's a really important drive to, to keep keep on focusing on delivery of low carbon generating capacity. And, and the slides earlier really picked some of that up. Um, but at the same time and in parallel, we need to make sure we've got the right uh, arrangements to remove barriers and, and promote um, uh, and provide value to, to those flexible assets to come on, on online. Right. So, I mean, ultimately, it's going to be about adding, you know, all this extra capacity and then balancing it not only in order to accommodate this massive growth in demand, but also to facilitate the, uh, you know, the retirement of fossil fuel plants, which, which will be essential, I guess. Okay. I mean, I guess you did touch on this a little bit in your answers here, but I think kind of a, a big question on a lot of people's lips uh, is, you know, what the best ways are to keep down the costs of the energy system uh, while meeting everyone's needs reliably and decarbonizing, you know, I think as the editor of a, an energy storage website, I see, so often these transformative uh, technologies, you know, and, and a lot of them are starting to come down in costs to the point where they are being used quite widely, but obviously some of that is a little bit further away and, and maybe there are non sort of technology strategies. So, yeah, I mean, I guess from, from you guys' points of view, what are the best ways to sort of keep down those, those costs really of, of the whole energy system while we keep reliable and, and decarbonized really, I guess? And maybe Andy, Andy, I can sort of kick off building on, on a previous response a little bit um, you know I, I guess at a macro level we can, we can build an energy system with very little flexibility in it um, but what we what we understand about that is that it will cost more we'll need more generation and uh, more networks to support that generation so I think for me the main point would be that um, if you want to build a, a, a lower cost uh, energy system to meet net zero whilst keeping that, that security of supply and reliability. Um, flexibility is a key part of that. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there are different different views and different numbers that, that keep coming out on this. Um, and some of that is in the uh, government's modeling to support the energy white paper. But more recently, the Carbon Trust, uh, I think back in May, uh, published their report on it. Um, and, and their view was that a more flexible system uh, is likely to deliver significant consumer benefits uh, by 2050. And the numbers they were quoting were around £17 billion per annum uh, in 2050 for, for a higher flexibility, flexible system. So it's an important part of keeping, keeping those costs down at a sort of macro level. Um, the other points I was just going to make and, and, and sort of builds on question one was really around, you know, at the end of the day, what we need to do is... is um, to, to keep costs down is prioritise policy that focuses uh, on what will have the most impact. And I think for, for me, um, that's delivering proven sort of low carbon generation this decade. Um, so some of the, the stuff we've, we've, we've seen in the slides, um, 
uh, offshore wind, onshore wind, solar, nuclear, all those sort of technologies, that capacity needs to grow. Um, we need to grow flexibility. Um, and then the other point I would make is that we can't reach net zero without some degree of innovation. Um, and therefore it's important this decade that we're looking at innovation so that we can take forward some of that less proven technologies um, into the 2030s and 40s uh, to, to, to keep costs down. Right. So, I mean, I guess the, you know, the energy sector investment cycle that will take us to 2050 is kind of already underway, really, isn't it? I guess if we think in those sort of terms. Um, I'm just wondering if we can get maybe Claire's view on, on this question as well, since uh, since we kind of started off that with uh, with the first question, really, I guess, in a way. Yeah, and I was going to say, actually, Andy, that's a good point that you pick up in terms of investment cycles. So I guess we're already on the journey of keeping costs down, because if we look back historically, the first step in that was to stimulate the market. So the EFR um, product that um, uh, Molly and Finley referred to and the government subsidies for solar were um, were introduced in part because of the acknowledgement that um, we would shift to a, a, a different network and system in the UK. We needed a way to, to manage the transition of that and keep costs low. Um, I think what's really important uh, going forward is to completely agree with Mark in terms of flexibility on the system and running in parallel with that really is ensuring that we have competitive markets where um, there's no uh, barriers to entry and those markets are working um, efficiently because a competitive market should result in lower costs for cost customers and consumers ultimately. And for both of those things, so the, the flexibility um, element and the, the kind of commercial competitive markets, it's really important that government policy is really clear and the regulatory frameworks are kind of stable and effective so that those markets and the and the products and the systems can develop which should also allow the network infrastructure to be thought about differently um, and and used differently compared to how it has been historically when um, the, everything that's set up in the UK frameworks and the physical infrastructure is about bulk shifting power rather than a more distributed um, decentralized system. Right, wow, okay. So there's a lot to unpack in there, but uh, obviously, I mean, I think with battery storage where we've seen, um, you know, the growth of competitive market models uh, you know, seem, you just seem to get this uh, growing levels of excellence in, in what's provided, uh, both in terms of the battery technologies and, and the optimization of them, really, I guess. Um, so, I mean, I think if we're looking at the battery storage market itself, so we, we've talked a little bit about the sort of generation profiles of the UK and, you know, accommodating that onto the grid. But in terms of the battery storage market, you know, we've largely, or you guys rather, I'm just a journalist, have largely moved to sort of merchant business models uh, from the you know the contracted revenues that began with the EFR tender uh, in 2016 that, that Molly spoke about. Um, so can this sort of merchant business model kind of market uh, adequately ensure the right level of investment in deployment of battery storage uh, that they that the UK needs um, in order to support renewables and the stability of the system? So. Can it be rewarding for market participants and kind of optimise the, the power system for, you know, the benefit of, of the whole UK, really, I guess? Um, who'd like to jump in on this one first? But, 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 but if I take that first, so the, the, the market's really changing at a remarkable uh, pace, as, as has been mentioned a few times before. A lot of the early projects, factory projects that were put on the system were really backed by things like EFR, perhaps the capacity market and some of the uh, FFR kind of monthly contracts and, and the odd pathfinder. But I think the investment case changes and it really is dictated by the, the route to market options that you have for the storage. Uh, this summer, it's been very much around the hybrid approach with the batteries being in DC, so providing services to grid, but also stacking uh, the services and revenues in, in the balancing markets and also in wholesale. So the asset has been used in a very different way to the way it probably was one one or two years ago. And even that's going to change where 
there are uh, alterations to the way that you can bid in for DC at the ether block level. And we also need to face into the fact that there are more batteries on the system to meet the demands for the DC product in the not too distant future. But I think everyone can be quite uh, buoyant around this merchant model. And I think the last two weeks has really demonstrated how flexible batteries are to be able to move into, into different markets. And certainly in the last two weeks, we've seen batteries opting out of the relative less safety of the DC mechanism and actually being used and traded in, in the wholesale market. Whereas most people know high gas prices, low wind and some outages has created quite a tight system and has allowed batteries to capture very strong day ahead revenues, trade the battery within day, and indeed make some money in, in the system prices. So if you look at the last couple of weeks, there's been some really strong income for batteries that really helps the investor have some confidence that it's not just relying on ancillaries, but there's also alternative routes to market for their projects. But we do believe as, as EDF that a mix of wholesale and ancillaries is probably the best uh, economic, economic model to, to have. Okay. And I was just going to say, I'm pretty sure most of the people watching will be aware, but DC, of course, being dynamic containment, yeah, uh, which is the, the most recently launched um, grid service opportunity for, for battery storage. Um, and, you know, it's thus far been pretty successful, but with the power spikes we've seen over the last few days, um, people are sort of switching their, their strategies around, uh, as you alluded to there, Stuart. Um, Mike, here, just wondering from a sort of technology provider and, you know, as a direct market participant, really, with, with technology in this, um, how do you sort of see that uh, evolving business model case for, for battery storage in the UK? Yeah, I think I'd echo a lot of what Stuart said. Um, for us as a developer, really at the sharp end and really going out and asking for money with projects, the, the model is is merchant. Certainly when we went out to the market a couple of years ago, we, we deliberately went out with a merchant only model um, because that was that was the future. Um, but if we're honest, most batteries today are still making a lot of their money from ancillary services. Um, weeks like this week and, and last week have shown that hopefully what we've been uh, looking at in modeling and, and with consultant support, etc. The future of the energy system is looking good for that merchant uh, horizon. Um, and if you look at the fundamentals of the, the energy system uh, as we go forwards to 2030, 2050, uh, there's a lot more flexibility uh, required. Um, but it's not the silver bullet. It is uh, kind of it has to working uh, with uh, the low carbon technologies that are coming. Um, I think it helps hugely uh, when National Grid produce uh, future energy scenarios and Bayes and Ofgem uh, come forward with smart energy systems um, and flexibility plans. And we're, we're looking at 20 or 30 gigawatts by 2030 and 60 gigawatts by 2050 in those models um, for flexible assets. So th those sort of horizons do help, um, certainly when you're looking for investment. Um, but let's let's be real at the moment. It's it's a, a huge kind of ancillaries dominated uh, market, but the, the signs are so strong, um, which is really good for investment. Excellent. Excellent. And of course, National Grid has made that future energy scenarios document available to view to the public, uh, unless I'm much mistaken, as they do every year. And that's definitely worth a look at. Um, in terms of, you know, the sort of progressive vision um, that you can see in there. Okay, so somewhat related question. And I just note that we have some fantastic questions coming in from the audience. So really looking forward to, to getting through to those. Um, but, you know, after the, I think, Mikey, you just alluded to it, but after the success of ancillary services so far, uh, what do we believe will be the right grid services and other emerging opportunities for energy storage uh, moving forwards? Um, who'd like to, to go for this one? I could probably just um, start off by echoing, I think, what Mikey said, like, the, the way forward is is um, a merchant model, you know, if you kind of, if you look backwards, um, most investment cases, even three years ago, um, three, four years ago, were built off the back of long term contracts, largely um, from the ESO, um, merchant 
models are, are viable going forward, but there, there's certainly options to supplement that. Um, and it is, it is supplemental, although it does feel um, fundamental at the minute, as Mikey alluded to with um, uh, some of the um, revenues that are flowing through things like ancillary services. I, I noted in the questions actually someone asked what ancillary services are. So they're the system support services that the electricity system operator buys to help it balance the system on the day. Um, I think there's some interesting um, opportunities opening up. They won't ever be the fundamental um, uh, principle of a business case, I don't think, but good um, supplemental revenue streams. So things like um, locating um, batteries where they can support EV charging on their strategic road network, um, potentially investment deferral um, on the networks or better use of the networks. So, um, so some interesting new opportunities opening up, I think. Right, of course, and it is that versatility of batteries to potentially tap into those multiple revenue streams that kind of make it so exciting, really, I guess, for, for a lot of people in the industry. Okay, anyone else got some, some views on this one? Yeah, I, I, I agree, Claire. I, I think the, the ancillaries are, are a good supplementary income, but there's lots of uh, activity going on um, around the both the, the, the post-fault and pre-fault uh, requirements from National Grid. So we're certainly looking to how we can put batteries into dynamic moderation and dynamic regulation. So we think that will become part of the, of, of the value stack. And as I think we understand more about the way the batteries behave and how they can respond within the limits of kind of warranty constraints, we do think that they could participate in other national grid initiatives such as beer and reserve. Uh, we, we know that the plant can be used for reactive power uh, at the TSO level. We're also looking to explore models about how storage and batteries can be used at the, perhaps the residential or commercial level to provide services in, into the DSO. So, I think the main message is there's lots of opportunities. It's just trying to figure out what the right use of the battery should be at the right time. I can probably add, probably add to that a little bit, Andy, if, if helpful. But I, I think I think hopefully everyone uh, kind of understands that batteries are incredibly flexibly electrically, but they're also um, pretty quick to deploy. Um, they can also offer things like, let's like just mention, kind of reactive power services, uh, locational services are becoming more and more important. Things like virtual power lines uh, are kind of fascinating thought points at the moment that we're, that we're looking at. If you've got overgeneration in Scotland, but you've, you're lacking um, power um, in the south, uh, can we do something uh, with kind of hybrid, hybridised assets? Um, so I, I think batteries have radically changed uh, how we see assets, particularly generation and consumption assets that can rapidly change um, direction, uh, vector in both uh, real power and reactive power. Um, but also as the, as the market for flexibility deepens, um, we're going to probably driven by low or extended periods of low inertia, etc. The depth of this kind of asset base is become, going to become increasingly important, and you'll start seeing kind of uh, durations extend, etc. Right. So okay. Okay. The flexibility and I think both, both, both in electrically, uh, but also how they can be deployed, uh, is really important. Sorry to talk over you. Awesome. No problem at all. No, and there's there's a couple of questions from the audience on you know some of those things you touched on. So let's do a couple more of these panel discussion questions. Um, and we'll get on to those. Uh, okay, so, you know, something that's been coming up quite a lot, maybe more in solar recently than it has in battery storage, but also relevant to batteries and, well, and everything at the moment, is the supply chains. Um, and, you know, just wondering if, in your view, uh, the UK clean energy, clean energy industry, sorry, has the access to the robust supply chains that it needs um, to support the rollout of clean energy technologies to the level that's required. Um, and, you know, if it's not too much of a crystal ball question, how might the sort of international and domestic supply chain dynamics um, play out over time? Um, and I think, you know, as a technology provider, maybe we'll start with you, Mikey, if, if we could on that, or rather a technology um, no provider. Yeah. It's, um, 
it's an it's a big deal, but it is getting it more and more important. The the more volumes that we want to deploy, the more uh, stringent we absolutely have to be. Uh, so we, we do keep an eye on other energy vectors because because the EV market for us really does drive uh, volume and price. But increasingly and very relevant, as you kind of alluded to at the moment, we are looking at sustainability and mining practices, making sure uh, what we're buying at the moment uh, is not causing kind of uh, huge damage to uh, countries uh, elsewhere. Um, Solar is suffering even more, but uh, the ethical considerations of buying lithium ion batteries for us, uh, which cells are, or uh, which raw materials are coming um, kind of out of the um, Uyghur area of China uh, is, is increasingly on people's minds. It's certainly changing the price of solar at the moment. Uh, mining in the DRC has always been an issue and you, you've seen a massive um, reduction in the amount of cobalt. Um, in NMC batteries, uh, partly driven by that. I think the good news is there are there is incredible amounts of research and, and commercialization of uh, new battery chemistries, et cetera, uh, that, that do away with a lot of these rare earth metals. Um, and there's a rapidly developing recycling industry as well. So it's not, hopefully we're moving very quickly away from a single use product um, into what could be a va valuable terminal asset um, that can be recycled. Uh, or reuse. Right, sure. I mean, we did a uh, webinar yesterday on cost of batteries, and a lot of the questions from the audience were about those circularity and sustainability topics. So, increasingly, you know, I think it's like everyone has to think about, um, but also an opportunity to, to think about it as well, I guess. Um, I'm just wondering what the dynamics of that sort of supply chain question are from the sort of transmission grid and, and, uh, and what, from national grid level, Claire? Um, I think probably um, different, but similar, say the um, the individual kind of challenges and characteristics of the supply chain are, are different, but similar in terms of, um, there's a huge amount of investment that needs to happen across the um, electricity network and energy network as a whole in the UK and globally, um, so, um, there's massive competition for resources and skills and capability um, that, that's kind of manifesting itself um, right across the value chain. And I think, um, as, as has been alluded to beforehand, things like, you know, the scenarios that are, are forecast and um, kind of government targets and things are really important for setting that expectation because it allows you to plan ahead a little bit and deal with some of those things. I think government policy as well and you know the leveling up agenda and trying to increase investment in this country will help as well and I'm sure over the next few years we'll start to see some of that capability um, it being increased um, domestically um, in recognition of the the kind of that overarching deliverability challenge that the, the entire industry is facing. Right okay so yeah, challenge on all fronts, really, I guess, um, in that way. Okay, anyone else want to jump in on this one before we move on? And if I may, I was just going to add, add on, on Claire's point, really, that um, not not really in the detail, but, but ultimately we need a joined-up policy approach across a number of these things, including supply chain. Um, uh, you know, these are very long-term, significant uh, challenges i guess opportunities um but it's also skills it's, it's probably planning as well all, all of this comes as a package to deliver a sort of you know policy framework to support net zero so i think it's um uh it's, it's really important right and i mean there's literally dozens of um gigafactories for batteries planned in europe you know in the, in the coming years planned or already under construction in several cases um, albeit that is largely driven by EVs, um, but also, you know, I think a lot of those, at least some of the ones I've spoken to, do believe that uh, stationary storage is going to be um, an important end market, I guess. All right, cool. So, yeah, I mean, while we're kind of sort of tangentially on, this, on the subject of technology, I guess, uh, today we've talked a lot about uh, utility scale solar and storage. And, you know, as Finley alluded to, the vast majority of solar and, and us, I would also say storage is, is utility scale in the UK, but 
Yeah, I mean, how important will sort of more distributed, small scale, behind the meter, uh, solar and storage uh, technologies be? Uh, and also, if I can kind of smash a couple of questions into one in the interest of brevity, uh, on the subject of technology, um, we've seen a lot of battery storage with fairly short durations of up to one hour uh, deployed at large scale so far. So I was wondering where you guys see that, uh, see the market going in that respect. Maybe I could do the, um, the kind of the, the network view. Um, so um, as I mentioned in the chat, and I say National Grid owns um, both transmission and distribution networks in the UK now. And I think the answer to your question is both um, a top down and a, and a bottom up approach. So from the kind of top down big stuff, if you like, um, it's been mentioned a few times already, but um, you know, we really are already seeing um, an increase in both size and duration of batteries. And I think that will continue um, both driven by just technology improvements, but actually needs on the system as well. It, um, it was mentioned that some of the newer services that um, batteries are participating in are starting to really value the speed with which that they contribute to um, the physics of the system. That can only increase, I think, as you can bolt into the back of that either long duration or, or size. And then I think if you look at the bottom up side of things and the decentralized system, um, there's um, this huge opportunity for um, um, vehicle to grid charging at the distribution level, which will fundamentally shift um, the way that the distribution systems are operated. Um, I think it's been mentioned a few times in the chat in terms of grid constraints and how we make sure that the the network infrastructure doesn't hold up deployment and actually batteries have got a role to play in that as well because if you move to a more decentralized system batteries actually probably do play a very important role in relieving some of those um, grid constraints and increasing the capacity um, as you start to see the systems and the networks being used completely differently to the ways in which they were designed to be. Right. I mean, as I, I understand it, well, from what little I understand, really, I guess, of vehicle to grid, it seems like a lot of the technology is ready to go, but obviously things like manufacturers' warranties aren't quite kind of up to that yet. And, you know, people aren't quite sure how it's best going to work. But if you look at it in very simple terms, you know, electric vehicle battery is generally something like four, five, six times larger uh, than the average household residential storage battery, right? So you've got a lot more juice potentially uh, to, to play with, I guess. And so at least part of that is, I guess, explains the, the potential and the appeal, which, you know, I, I hate to see a lot more of anyway, personally. Okay. Um, yeah. So anyone else want to jump in on this one in terms of technologies, be it distributed, larger scale or, or whatever you like, really, I guess. And, and yeah, I was just going to chip in a little bit on... Um, perhaps some uncertainties in, in this space. Uh, you know, Ofgem, the energy regulator, have obviously been reviewing network charging uh, for the last few years. Um, some of the reforms they've already implemented have had quite material impacts on, on some of these market sectors. And I guess, you know, where we are at the moment is, is Ofgem is still reviewing some elements that are going to be quite important to the economics and the, and the costs and, and indeed the incentives for people connecting at distribution levels. Um, and we're expecting further announcements from Ofgem towards the end of this year, which I think will be quite quite important to, to understand the, econ the, the their effect anyway on the economics of these smaller scale distributed assets. I think from my point of view, the, 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 the economics aren't that clear at the moment, but one of the key challenges for us is uh, how you can give the consumer confidence that you're taking control of, of their energy assets, of, of charging their EV, particularly for vehicle to grid and also making sure you've got the right software to be able to connect and control the, um, the, the assets in a reliable way. So it's a slightly different challenge to, to the bigger utility scale assets when you start getting uh, consumers involved. Okay. And Mikey, from a tech, from an engineer's point of view, how do you sort of see that whole play? Not just vehicle to grid, but long duration as well. Oh, sorry. So right. It's been two years doing video conferences and I still don't hit mute. Um, 
it's uh, I can certainly talk to the kind of duration side of utilities scale. So you're absolutely right. We've seen fairly short duration. EFR was certainly centered around what half an hour to 45 minutes and they've grown only a little bit um, in the light in the few years since then. I think everything going forward, certainly speaking for ourselves, everything we do that's going through investment decisions uh, or have gone through it recently are all at two hours. I suspect uh, that trend will continue. Certainly our US colleagues in um, EDF Renewables US um, are uh, four to eight hours uh, seems to be the sweet spot when they're hybridizing with uh, solar. Um, and we're also trialing things like flow, a flow battery. So we've got a uh, two megawatt um, battery, flow battery going into our site in Oxford uh, to, to really understand kind of the benefits of a both a different technology, but also a longer duration um, type battery uh, with lower degradation um, characteristics. So, so it, it, the technology will change as well as the duration. Uh, and I think as you get longer, that will become more and more. Uh, so um, uh, hy hybridizing uh, systems is also going to become a, a much bigger thing, I think, in the future. Excellent, you know, and I could I could uh, really you know keep listening to stuff about future technologies all day long, but we haven't got all day, unfortunately. So I'm just going to say very quickly, if you guys could keep these answers brief, I just want to give you a chance to give your sort of closing statements, either your closing statements on the UK's adoption of renewable energy or your one key immediate priority um, that you think that the uh, the UK should be focusing on. Um, let's go in the order of, okay, Claire first. Um, so I, I've mentioned it a few times already, but stability and agility of the regulatory framework so it doesn't um, block the development of either the technology innovation or the market development. Excellent. Thanks, Claire. And Mikey, quick one from you. Um, I, I, on the same topic, the regulatory environment uh, is key. It is moving in a regulatory context at breakneck speed. Um, but batteries still, I think, need to be recognized as, as their own asset. They're still generators in many contexts and for, for good historic reasons. Um, but they really, I think, should be recognized for the flexibility they bring. Um, and also in the context of EVs and hydrogen, which are getting a lot of government focus. It, it, I don't think bat batteries and really flexible assets are getting the attention they might do. So that, that's definitely something that we are pushing Okay, okay, thanks. And chaps from uh, EDF, Mark, uh, what are your final points? Uh, yeah, a little bit to build on, on Mikey as well, just to, you know, I guess we shouldn't underestimate the scale of the challenge that we need to, to deliver. And I think the key for me is just delivering some of those policies uh, to support that uh, as quickly as possible. Thanks, Mark. And Stuart? Uh, I think for me, keep driving innovation, keep testing the new business models. I think make sure you choose the right partners to collaborate with. You know, these are long-term uh, infrastructure assets that are there to, to try and uh, really drive net zero. So keep, keep going, keep patient. Fantastic, keep calm and carry on, I guess, <laughs> to an extent. Okay, sure, so questions from the audience. We've just got a few minutes to go through with these. And I think we managed, or you guys have managed to answer quite a few of them already, which is great. Um, obviously, if you'd like to know more about anything we talked about, the email address is on the screen for you to get in touch with EDF. Um, so there's a question here from uh, Russell Beal Birchall. Thanks, Russell. Uh, given that the system will, in the longer term, uh, be a network of connected devices, uh, what considerations need to be taken into account to make sure that the broader system is cyber secure with a consistent security posture? Um, yeah, anyone got any views on that? I can, can certainly attest to the pressure we get um, internally, obviously with a nuclear heritage. Um, this is a, a really big work stream for us. Um, but I think increasingly um, even developers without that um, are coming on board. Um, but there's, there's a, a long way to go. I think as we become more reliant on flexible assets, uh, we're probably getting into the realm of needing standards for what historically would be described as significant assets 
um, or security, security kind of assets. Um, and we probably need to start looking at standards for that. There's no two ways about it. Okay, anyone else got, got a quick view on that? Yeah, I was just going to say generally a trans anything that's connected at a transmission level is caught by um, uh, rules around kind of comms protocols and things at the minute. Um, as, as, as Mikey alluded to, the, um, the trickiness comes is that becomes more and more decentralised, um, which uh, by its nature means it's not caught by all of the centralised um, arrangements. So getting something in place that manages that appropriately without becoming a um, you know ridiculous burden that creates a barrier to entry would be important. Right, okay. Okay, thanks. So question here from Rachel uh, Bravard, um, asking about kind of what the role, I guess, of energy storage is in sort of the urban landscape and how can we ensure the location of energy storage uh, takes into account increasing city-based loads where renewable energy production is all but non-existent. That's something I've seen that sort of New York's been uh, kind of you know challenged with recently. But I just wonder how that sort of fits with the UK, uh, you know, the more distributed energy system versus utility scale. Is that is that a fair question? Anyone want to take that one on quickly? I'm happy to build a little bit on a point I made earlier around kind of locational value. Um, so whilst kind of transmission assets and very large assets probably don't need to be super close to urban environments. They do need to be in the right part of the country. Uh, and we do need to look at services that get power from where it's generated to where it's consumed. So, so whilst I don't think the location right adjacent to major load centres is important, certainly the area uh, that's important from a kind of a transmission of large volumes of energy from one part of the country to another um, and, and it's, it's a big topic already. Um, I, I certainly think one of our approaches to electric vehicle infrastructure is that we do need to give access to uh, bigger volumes of power near urban centres um, for the kind of rapid increase in, in charging and urban consumers without driveways predominantly uh, are the ones that really suffer. So I think it's a really solid question. Does that, I mean, does that give battery storage a bigger role in the transmission sector as well? Do we think? Because I've seen a few sort of virtual transmission uh, type projects in, in places around the world. Just wondering if that's something any of you guys have, have kind of been looking at. I think, I think batteries have got a role to play at both the transmission and the distribution level. I think in answer to, to the earlier question, lots of issues around planning, getting the right connection, the, the cost of the build all, all impacts on the economics and the viability of these projects. So we probably need to see some of the build costs come down um, and perhaps some of the planning uh, revised to really drive the, the development of, of these kind of infrastructure assets in, in more urban locations. Right, so I guess that's partly not really where the, the business case or the sort of planning viewpoint is is at the moment, I guess. Okay, there's a question that uh, caught my eye here from uh, Fouad Tahir. Um, and, you know, what is the panel's view on short duration batteries versus seasonal hydrogen storage? Do they compete? Are they complementary? Uh, also, does storage and renewables now make any other low carbon generation, such as biomass, CCS or nuclear uh, obsolete? I'm ha happy to pick it up and, and just reiterate a point from earlier that like the, the storage we're building now and, and I suspect the storage we build in the future is, is not a silver bullet. I think it will have to uh, be complementary to a low carbon mix um, which is likely to involve some nuclear in, it likely to involve carbon capture um, and, and they're not generators fundamentally so I, I think they're, they're complementary. Um, I think seasonal storage uh, is a hot topic um, and I, I think it's I think the jury's out a little bit as to the value of it um, but there's no two ways about it weeks like we've had uh, this week with um, a period of low wind uh, means that we need to make sure the system continues to be resilient uh, and working with grid and grid working with developers um, like they do 
to make sure we've got products and assets um, in the right place uh, in a timely manner. I was just going to chip in and, and just say, you know, my view is certainly that these these technologies are probably co complementary at this point in time. Um, it comes back to a previous point I made is that we need to focus on stuff that we can actually del deliver this decade. Um, and But at the same time, look at innovations because we're going to need some of those things absolutely in the 2030s and 40s. And if we don't start innovating and, and demonstrating and researching and, and, and so on, then um, we're not going to meet net zero. So I think we've got to, we've got to deliver the stuff we was proven and known, um, but at the same time, we're, we're going to need to focus on some of those other things as well. Fantastic. Okay, thanks, Mark. Okay, some, some more really high quality questions from the audience, but unfortunately, we've pretty much run out of time for today. Um, if you did put in a question that wasn't answered, then um, EDF will be able to hopefully follow up with you. Um, of course, always feel free to get in touch with us at Energy Storage News as well. Uh, but for now, I just want to say, you know, thank you very much to everyone for joining us. Thanks so much to everyone in the low carbon energy sector for all your hard work. Um, it's been a great discussion today. And uh, yeah, from, from me and from all the panelists, just want to say thank you so much. And uh, we hope to see you again soon.